and welcome to Autism in Conversation with Auticon, a podcast from Auticon, a global IT consultancy whose consultants are all autistic. This series is designed to help raise greater understanding and appreciation of autism through fascinating conversations with inspirational guests. Hosted by me, Carrie Grant, MBE. Each episode will feature brilliant guests from all walks of life who each share a passion for making the world more inclusive. We'll be talking about the many benefits of hiring neurodivergent talent through to some of the more common challenges faced by autistic adults navigating the workplace, plus much, much more. All of my four children are neurodivergent, so this is a subject that's very close to my heart, and I'm really looking forward to facilitating some great conversations about autism and hopefully learning some new things along the way. I hope you enjoy. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Autism in Conversation with Auticon. Now, parenting a child who is autistic can take families on an unexpected journey, from receiving a diagnosis to adapting parenting styles accordingly, through to acting as your child's advocate to getting the support that they need. If you've listened to the podcast before, you'll know that each episode is all about giving a voice to people's real-life experiences, offering advice and support for anyone who may be in a similar situation, and that's what we'll be doing today. This episode will be doing things a little bit differently, though, as I'll be interviewing my husband, yes, fellow broadcaster, vocal coach and leadership coach and campaigner David Grant, as we talk about our own experiences of raising four neurodivergent children. Welcome to the show, David. Wow, nice to be here, (laughs) Carrie. So for those people that don't know about our family, could you just give us a rundown of our kids? Okay, we have four children. Um, our eldest, Olive, is um, a- an actor. Uh, our and Olive is twenty-seven. Uh, next in line is Tylan, who is twenty and also an actor. Next in line is Arlo, who is sixteen and at school. And next is in line is Nathan, who is twelve and. Supposed to be at school, but currently not in school. Yes. Okay. So you just had a little bit of a hint towards their not in school. That's been a familiar experience for us with three out of the four children. Absolutely. Uh, because the, you've named all of their ages and their, their names and stuff. But what about their diagnoses? Just run me by some of the uh, diagnoses that our children have got. Okay, I will. But because this is like a pick and mix, um, at which point, I'm bound to forget some. Will you jump in if I forget any? Yes. Because you know them as well as I do. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Olive um, has a dyspraxia and uh, ADHD. Um, Tylan um, is on the autism spectrum. Um, Arlo, our third, is on the autism spectrum. And Nathan... No, hang on a minute. Rewind, rewind. Back up, back up. Arlo is autistic and has ADHD. Arlo's, of course, yes, I forgot. Arlo has a whole a whole sort of, like, coterie. Um, yeah, these disabilities, they, they're travelling gangs, don't they? Arlo's <laughs> autistic and has ADHD. Um, Nathan, a 12-year-old, has ADHD, um, DMDD, um, probably dyslexia, um, even though they're, they're still working on a diagnosis. And, um, yeah, we, we have, you know, at some point, if anybody does um, disability bingo, we jump up and say house. Yeah. Well, it's interesting you say disability because I don't really think of them as being disabilities. I think of them as being just different. I don't think of them as... There are only disabilities in the light of the fact that the world is so unaccepting. That's very true. I think that one of the things with an invisible disability, so it's called, is that, you know, if we, uh, what we have done in in our family is to recognise that the reason why it's called a disability is because some people find it more challenging to do things that neurotypical people take for granted. On the other hand, with our children, it's also proven to be a different ability because so many of them are able in ways in so many ways that they might not otherwise be able. You know, they're, 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 they're gifted in ways that they might otherwise not be gifted, that they're different and see the world in ways that absolutely challenge a neurotypical vision of the world. Yeah, and that's what we love about them. 
So tell me what it was like when all of these diagnoses that you've just mentioned there started to, to pop up. What, what was, how did that come about and what were your feelings? Well, it's interesting. I've spoken to so many parents because, you know, um, we run parent groups um, and I've spoken to so many parents about the initial diagnosis and the reactions have been very, very many and varied. You know, for some people, it's a bit of a shock. For some people, it's it's almost like a disappointment. For others, it's a surprise. Uh, for others, it's an explanation. And I would say for us, or certainly for me, it was in part an explanation. Um, and also in part a sort of a wake-up call that said to me, this journey isn't going to be anything that you might have imagined it is going to be. We don't know what it's going to be, but what we do know is that it's going to, you know, it's going to plough its own field and chart its own course. When we first got the diagnosis of um, our second and third, Tylan and Arlo, um, the ones who are now 20 and 16, which we got the, the autism diagnosis on the same day. Um, Ty was seven, Arlo was three. What was that like for you? I have to be honest, there was absolutely no sort of like heightened emotion connected to it, concern or, or disappointment or what was there was, okay, I need to now discover what this means. Yeah. Um, What this means for them what this means for us um, and, and, and how it makes things different. Is it going to make things different? If it does, how is it going to make things different? Because it didn't change them in any way. Yeah, the like they got in the didn't... car, you got given the diagnosis and then they just got in the car and they were still Tylan and Arlo, weren't they? They had to change with that they, bit of paper. Still, it, yeah, it didn't change them one dot, one jot, one bit what it did change was my awareness of who they were what it did change is my awareness that they may see the world a different way and I didn't know what that was going to be because they're only seven and three but what I did know was that the kind of journey that you can prescribe and chart out and say that the raising of a child is likely to fall within these parameters. There may be anywhere from, you know, track A to track B, but the train is going to run along these tracks in some way. That went completely out of the window. Um, I didn't realise at the time just how far out of the window it was going to go. <laughs> but I did think, OK, this changes things. And one of them, I mean, some people might call it exciting with the benefit of hindsight, but at the time, slightly sort of, um, slightly nerve-wracking things was having no idea of what it meant was going to change as they grew and as they developed and as they began to inhabit the fullness of their personhood and and understand the fullness of their identities what was going to change well we didn't know and I think that you know, there's a saying that every autistic person probably knows, which is if you've, met, if you've met one autistic person, you've met one autistic person. And even with just having two children on the spectrum in the family, the presentation is so entirely different. Yeah, they are. That if somebody said to me, when we got the diagnosis, this is what autism looked like, and used one of them as an illustration, it would have completely excluded the other. Because yeah, they, the other one wouldn't have got a diagnosis based on that. It's a very, very good Absolutely. point. So you've talked about what it was like to kind of grow in your knowledge of them and who they might become and to understand them a little. Uh, but what about parenting? Have you changed as a parent? This was 2009, if I remember. So we've had a good few years since. Have you changed as a parent? As a parent, I am unrecognisable from the parent I was in 2009. Now, let's be sort of, you know, really sort of honest about this. Anybody who has raised a child will say, well, yes, of course, the parent you are to a 16-year-old isn't the same parent you are to a three-year-old. So there's that. There's the natural evolution of your relationship that happens as your child grows and matures. But there's also... I think that certainly for me, having children on the spectrum, it meant that I needed to really abandon everything I thought I knew about parenting. It meant that I had to 
discover and develop a bespoke style of parenting that fitted specifically the child that was in front of me, rather than having a general sort of one-size-fits-all approach, because it absolutely didn't fit. And, you know, really, it's not to my credit that I think that I was quite resistant to that, because I thought, well, if they don't fit the one-size-fits-all, then it's obviously because I'm not implementing the one-size-fits-all with enough vigour. So, you know, <laughs> I need to, <laughs> I need to just retrench and like like double down on the one size fits all and it will work and the fact is it was never going to work and it kind of I would say out of the two of us I was you you were the hair when it came to realizing that we needed to to adapt and and adopt a new parenting style and we needed to be fluid and I was very much the tortoise there was a kind of rigidity of no this is how you do it um and, you know, I, I think that with regard to parenting, having children on the autism spectrum has taught me and continues to teach me, is teaching me to be a parent I would otherwise never have been. And I think that had I never have been, I would have missed a lot. There's a lot of their growing up that I got by constantly having to reassess and reappraise and recognise who they are now, you know, not living on who they were last year or last week even. You know, who are they now? Who are they today? And who do they need me to be today? Yeah. So you talked about the fact that it took you a little bit longer. You, you, you describe yourself as the tortoise. Um, so how, how, long, how long was that then? Well, I made the tortoise seem like, Sir Lewis Hamilton. I mean, <laughs> we got the diagnosis in 2009. Up until about 2012, I thought, there's something wrong with these kids because they're really not getting my style of parenting. <laughs> about 2012, I began to realise there was something wrong with me because I wasn't being the parent they needed me to be. And then I was all at sea. I think I took a little while to actually work out, if I've got autistic kids... I, I need I need to learn. It's not me teaching them and them learning how to be. It's 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 actually me learning. And I think that I think that when I kind of was humble enough to recognize that I didn't actually know. You know, sometimes you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. But when you've got autistic children and this and they need you to be a parent. You have to learn what you don't know. You have to realise what you don't know. And certainly in my case, I think I learned a lot from watching you, but I also learned a lot from realising that I couldn't be you and I couldn't just be you with a deeper voice, that I actually had to change me. Yeah. I couldn't just ape behaviour that I saw with someone else. I had to change the way my outlook. And gosh, I would say that you're saying, how long did it take me? Well, the diagnosis arrived 13 years ago and I consider myself still to be under construction and a work in progress because the dad that I was five years ago that they needed me to be five years ago isn't the dad they need me to be now because they've changed yeah you talked a little bit there about you said this lovely phrase bespoke parenting mm. so just give me some examples of what you have bespoked <laughs> bespoken this <is> bespoken okay. <laughs> Okay, it's interesting because with our 16-year-old, there is a, um, a rigidity of actions that isn't always, so it wasn't just a rigidity of thinking. So with, with Arlo, um, we have certain things. Um, I am, my face is a stress toy. I actually, <laughs> I mean, I know, I know I look like this, but, you know, I think I would look about, maybe 15 years younger, if not for Arlo, uh, <laughs> who Arlo has to squeeze my face and they always squeeze my face. And there are certain things that we do. There are certain um, actions that we do. There are certain little dances we do. There are certain words that we say. I don't and, even and understand your communication. I mean, you two are like a whole, you're like a double act. I know. It's all part of my being father to Arlo is that we have loads of unspoken communication 
that, that revolve around movement and actions and dances and laughing at the same thing that other people don't understand what's going on. I've had to learn that. I've had to enter into Arlo's world and learn how that world works. Um, on a practical thing, Arlo loves to have drives. They, they, they want to have a drive once a day. It's part of a de-stressor towards the end of the day. A drive. You know, some people read or watch TV or they're too young to have a drink. They go on a drive. They sit in the car listening to music and we drive. And 40 minutes later, half an hour, 40 minutes later, we arrive back home and they're in a different headspace to the one they were when we left. And that's an important thing. So whatever the schedule of my day, if I'm at home or if I'm coming home, I know I need to be home for that drive for Arlo because that's an important part of parenting Arlo. And it's it's an interesting thing that to me, it's not even, I don't even think of it as, as a chore or a stress. It's just part of being a dad. It's part of being their dad. Yeah. Because I actually think that, you know, speaking of bespoke parenting, I, I, I could quite probably be a rubbish dad to every other child in the world but I've learned how to be the dad that the children I have need yeah and that's that is bespoke it is also humor you have loads of humor I would say with Arlo yeah yeah we we laugh a lot uh, mostly at me (laughs) but often at Arlo because Arlo is really funny and Arlo has learned to laugh at themselves in a way that they couldn't when they were younger. You know, in their early teens, they could not laugh at themselves because I think they felt such a level of, of low, low self-worth and such a lack of confidence that to laugh with them at themselves would have been perceived to be laughing at them. Mm. And one of the ways that I can see that their confidence is growing and their belief that they have a place in the world is growing is by how much they laugh at themselves, how much of their humour is directed inwards. Yeah, I'd agree with you on that. Okay, so that's Arlo, who's our 16-year-old. What about Thailand? Mm. Because Thailand is very different. What have you had to change in your your parenting of Thailand? What's changed there there for them? I think in my parenting of Thailand, what's changed is to listen to Thai, is to really listen, is to not be so ready to give advice, not be so ready to give an answer, because even sometimes when Ty says, I need to know what to do, I know that what will happen is that I'll be giving answers and they'll be saying, no, those aren't the answers, that's really bad advice. What I should be doing is this. So it's almost like they're using me as a sounding board. A classic example is when we were on our way up to to Hollyoaks for their final audition. Um, Ty is one of the members of the cast of Hollyoaks now and it was their final audition and they were absolutely wrapped with nerves and we're driving along the M1 and they're almost crying with nerves and I thought this is this is this isn't good for them this really isn't good and I said you know what I want you to know you don't have to do this we can turn the car around and we can go back and they said that's the worst thing you could have said. You can't say that. This is what you're <laughs> supposed to say. And they told me what they wanted to hear. And, you know, it's, it's a completely different kind of relationship to other. And how we connect and how we relate is to share time together. Yes. And that's, that's the wonderful thing with Ty. I mean, Ty will say, there's a, there's a box set that I'm, I've been watching and I really want you to watch it. So I'll sit and watch. And, you know, maybe in the course of an hour, we'll say three or four sentences. But to time, that's together time. That's valuable time. That's That's been our time. And, you know, it'll be, I'll get a text with, have a listen to this music, or I'll send them some music. And, you know, Ty listens and goes, yeah, I like this. I really like this. And then he He'll put that on his playlist and that'll be, and, and that will be a connection and a communication because what Ty really loves, one of the things that Ty loves is that feeling of being part of my heritage and, you know, my dad played this for me or my dad told me about this. And then what Ty does then is to do the same for me. He'll say, I know you'll like this. Have you heard of such and such? And it'll be somebody that I liked when I was 20 years old or something. Uh-huh. And, and, and then we'll, we'll, we'll connect on that level. But 
it's a very, very different communication to Arlo's, but it's just as deep and it's just as valid, but it's entirely different. And if I was to switch and relate to Ty, like I do to Arlo, and relate to Arlo, like I do to Ty, I would be completely disconnected. <laughs> I from think you'd have a couple of meltdowns going on there, for sure. Yes. Yeah. Um, so you, you and I have run a parent support group. It has over 180 parents, families... In it, and we work with the families and, and with the children. Um, that's been running for a very long while. And over lockdown, you have run your weekly meeting online every single week for those parents. And I've been absolutely in, amazed and marvel at you and your consistency and the way that you love those parents is just wonderful. I love them too, uh, by the way. But I, I, I love watching you talk to, to them. If there's parents of autistic children listening today or families of autistic uh, children, what advice would you have? You know those parents when they join our, our group, what, what do they most need to hear? I think what most autistic parents, well, sorry, most parents of autistic children that join our group need to hear is that they're not alone on this journey. I don't think that most people need parenting advice. Occasionally people will ask, look, this is a situation. How would you approach this situation and ask the group? But generally, I mean, we're talking about super parents, parents who sacrifice everything and are willing to sacrifice everything. And by that, I'm not talking about, you know, money or material. I'm talking about themselves. They're uh, their hopes, aspirations, dreams, whatever they'd expected for themselves later on in life. It's just like that, all of that gets put into uh, a margin, that gets parked, and everything is focused on the needs of their children. So what they need to hear generally is you're not alone on this journey. We've all walked this journey. And so when you say something that to somebody else who who isn't on this journey may sound outrageous, about how you feel, about what you're going through, about how challenging or difficult or impossible you feel, how inadequate you feel to the task. It's fine to say it here because we've all felt it and we've all expressed it. And the other thing is having a space in your life where you can describe without having to explain. I think that so much energy is spent and and wasted and exhausted by people feeling as though they have to explain their children. They have to explain their situation. They stand with a, a teacher. People say, oh, your child's, your child's not like that at all. Your child's like this. And they go, well, no, you don't know the whole picture. There is a different person at home to the one in school or the one not in school because they refuse to go into school or the one not sleeping because they refuse to go to bed or whatever. Just having a space where you can describe, but you don't have to explain because everybody else who is listening to you gets it. So is your advice that people link up with other parents? I think it's, it's really important to do that. I think it's so important to do that because I think that, you know, Albert Einstein said, if you measured a fish by how well it climbed a tree, you would think it was stupid. And quite often all we get in terms of a metric for our own children is the yardstick of, of a kind of neurotypical world. And if the neurotypical world is the tree, our children may be the fastest swimmer in the ocean, but they're not going to climb the tree. So, yes, I think it's really important to link up with other parents who are walking the same walk, others who are in the same situation, others who will be able to listen to you and not just sympathise and not just empathise, but experientially understand. Yeah. Now, I know for many of our families that, that we support, there's there's quite a high percentage of their children and young people, and we see this in the adults as, as well, autistic adults, um, might be struggling with their mental health. What have you learned about coming alongside our children in their mental health crises? Wow. 
I think I've learned more than anything that there's no quick fix. There are no easy answers. And presence is everything. And that, you know, there's no guarantee that if you do A and B, you're going to get C, that two and two are going to add to four. But what I do know is this, that our children, even when they, we we sometimes become the rock against which they bash and we feel bashed, but we're the only rocks they've got. And so the thing that I think is how important it is to be there and and to listen and when possible to talk them down and when necessary to talk them up. And also more than anything to also come alongside others so that we guard our own mental health. Because it's impossible to carry somebody if you're limping. Mm. You know, it's really so much harder. And, yeah, our children's mental health, it's, a, it's such a big deal. It's such a big deal. And, and it can it can turn on a sixpence. Everything can be going well. And then one thing real or imagined one thing can completely transform the picture and so I think that most parents I know with autistic children live at such a a level of hyper vigilance that if anything it's it's yeah do what you do and be there the way that you're there but but please remember your own mental health remember your own need for support remember your own need to be heard yeah, and to find voice. Just moving on to, I guess, that thing of school and the workplace. How well or not well are things set up for allowing our neurodivergent people to thrive? Wow. <laughs> That's really interesting. Uh, it's an interesting question because the question in itself is it presupposes that any advanced society would recognize that there is more than one way of seeing the world and there is more than one way of thinking. And therefore, an advanced society like ours would set things up that everybody, whatever their, not just their worldview, but whatever their neurological situation would be able to say, yeah, there's a space for me, there's a place for me, there's an opening for me, there's an acceptance of me. People are making the allowances I need made so that I can thrive, not just so that I can fit in and limp along, but so that I can thrive. But that doesn't really exist in anywhere like the the number that it should. The number of employers who, I think employers should be made to you know, like have a, a, a number of people who are on the on the on the autism spectrum, a number of people who have just you know have a neurodivergent. I think it's really important we get away from this cookie cutter, one size fits all. Everyone has to look the same and replicate one another's strengths in order to fit in. And yeah, I suppose my answer so far suggests that I don't think that nearly enough is done. I don't think that nearly enough is being done. There's so much talent and there's so much ability. There's so much intuition and knowledge and just being wasted, being sidelined, being overlooked, being ignored. And if it wasn't overlooked, how much richer we'd be. The companies that actively seek out people on the spectrum because they have an attention to detail perhaps that others don't have, or they have a skill set that others, or a special interest, which means that, you know, they know their stuff almost as much as a PhD student would know, just because they've taught themselves. That kind of autodidactic skills that so many autistic people have, if only there was a recognition that, that these aren't just skills that, that come from a hobby. These are skills that become so deeply ingrained, so knowledge-based and so worthwhile that, that they, they're valuable. You know, if we could find 
and be made to find ways to fully utilise the gifts and the talents that we have from people on the autism spectrum, the world would be a much richer place because so many of the things that enrich the modern world were devised or created, developed or initiated by people on the autism spectrum. Yeah, which is exactly what Autocon are trying to do. That's their, that's absolutely, you've just given their remit basically there, David. Um, and and we know that for, for Thailand, their, their workplace at Hollyoaks, has, they've made all those kinds of adjustments for Thailand. So there is some good practice happening out there, isn't there? But There is. But probably not enough. And I do wonder also about people even disclosing that, they are autistic before they even can even get to these are uh, the needs that I might have it is this this sense of disclosure how do we change perceptions out there David gosh I think that we we change perceptions by I think drawing a line that delineates between our understanding of terminology and understanding that the term different and the term normal shouldn't actually be the opposite of one another. That your normal isn't my normal and that your differences could complement my differences. The fact is that we've created an environment where too often people who are different in any way feel as though they have to underplay or deny their differences and create some kind of fake, fake normal that fits with other people. And I don't think that that, I don't think that that's, that's right. And I don't think it helps, but I can understand why, you know, somebody walked into a typical audition and started by saying, I'm autistic. Um, they don't know the, they don't know the reaction they're going to get. They don't know whether the person sitting opposite them is going to go, you know, yeah, fine. Um, you almost want to go in and say, could you just tell me what you think autis autistic looks like? Hear what they say and then say, oh, yes, I'm one of those or I'm not. <laughs> I'm not that. Uh, you, it pre you have to kind of assume you, well, you can't assume that the person even understands what you're saying. I think that's that's part of the issue. And that's it. And that, and that, and that again comes down, comes back to. You know, that old adage, if you've met one autistic person, you've met one autistic person because I think that somewhere along the line, people, even people who have no idea what autistic actually means, have a feeling about what it means. And that feeling is often based on nothing. Yeah. And, and therefore, if someone says, I'm autistic, you have a feeling that that means they're going to be very different to you. They're maybe not going to fit in. That maybe they're going to be, you know, like, they're not team players. That maybe they're just odd. And they're not. And, it, you know, it, it's almost like if you are different from a neurotypical norm, rather than being celebrated, rather than being recognised that with that could come something that the neurotypical norm doesn't have. Yeah. You know, there's an old saying about genius, and I don't, and I'm not suggesting autism equals genius. What I'm saying is that I think it applies to difference, which is that, you know, um, is that the talent hits a mark others can't reach, genius hits a mark others can't see. I think the thing with most people that I know who are autistic is that they actually, they see things that others can't see. They perceive, they dream things, they imagine things. And sometimes it's, it, they spend so much energy trying to pull what's their normal into a neurotypical normal that it's really unhealthy for them. Mm. How about just saying, bring your normal with you and let's stand it alongside our normal. You don't have to fit our norm. You be you and bring you to the party. Bring what you have to the table and let's add what you've got to what we've got and make something that's collective that neither of us would have without one another. Yeah, absolutely. Joining those gifts and skills together. And finally, is there anything that you would like to say? You know, I'm thinking particularly about autistic people entering into the workplace and 
feeling a bit nervous about that and um, perhaps even into the creative industries um, as well? I'd say that it's been said that autistic people are the creators of the modern world. And to some extent, that's true. To a large extent, that's true. Does it mean that autism doesn't have its challenges? Well, being the parent of autistic children, of course it has its challenges. But what, what I would say is to please try and to go confidently into the workplace, not feeling as though you must somehow mask or diminish who you are and what you have. Bring what you have to the party. And if people don't get it, there will be a place and there will be those who don't just get it, but who want it and who value it and who value what you are and who value what you have. Those are your people and they are out there. And little by little, in increasing numbers, they're out there. And wave by wave, the tide is turning. Thank you very much, David Grant. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. We really hope you enjoyed this episode of Autism in Conversation with Auticon. This episode was recorded in April 2022 and contributors are using community preference language at this time. Recording and production was at Strathmore Studios in Clerkenwell, London, and it was engineered and edited by Billy Godfrey, and music was by The Lethargies. If you'd like to know more about the podcast, would be interested in applying for a job as an Auticon consultant, or would like further information about how Auticon can help support your business, please visit auticon.co.uk. That's all from us this time. Bye for now.